بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله In the name of Allah the gracious the merciful all praise is due to Allah the Lord of the universe the master of the day of judgment I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah to his magnificence, his omnipotence, his might, his glory, to his being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. The fundamental relationship that you and I have with our Creator, Azzawajal, is that He is Rabb, and that you and I individually, I am Abd. The definition of being an Abd can be translated as a worshiper, a servant, but at its base understanding, you are an abd because you require and reliance on something else to exist. And Allah Azawajal uniquely is al-ghani, he is self-sufficient. He does not rely on anything for his existence. And where we can nuance the relationship between an abd and our rabb, is to recognize in terms of what it is that our Rabb, Allah Zawjal, our Creator, our Sustainer, the one that before there was anything, there is Him, and after there is nothing, there will still be Him. He is the first, He is the last, the most gentle, the most kind. What Allah gives to us, amongst so many other things, is knowledge, ilm. And what we in turn give to Allah is amal, actions, deeds. The ability to understand this as a foundational variable in our relationship with the Divine because you and I are not giving to our Creator knowledge. He is the one that gives to us knowledge. And Allah Zawjal is not presenting actions to you and I. We are presenting actions to Him. The connection here necessitates an understanding that quite often gets lost in a mode of default settings where we move through the world simply as bodies, not aware of anything that our organs of sensory perception are taking in that can enable us to find deeper meaning both in the world outside of us as well as the world within us. To be in a place where I have firm awareness of what I am putting into this dunya and an idea that gives an understanding that all it is that I'm going to take with me is going to be deeds, actions, things that came from me consciously or unconsciously. May Allah make us from amongst those whose books are filled with only things that are pleasing to Him. And the base of what gives that action, that inevitably, Ultimately, we are going to be presenting to our Creator the same way that your body is in a state of life, not because the body in and of itself is alive on its own, but the soul that is within it is what gives it that vitality. The soul of your actions 
is going to be what we are taught is sincerity, making sure that it's being done for the right reasons, not for anything that is rooted in other than the sake of the divine. It becomes hard to be able to at times recognize that is there ikhlas in what it is that I'm doing? Is there sincerity? The opportunity to be able to think about it more deeply and to reflect upon it in terms of what gets in the way. Where can I be vulnerable to what my actual motivations are? What it is that's bringing me to what it is that I do? And if you're not in a place where there is presence to the deed, it doesn't mean that things are still not getting done. The gift of intention that enables us to now find that much more meaning, distinct from the rest of creation, and playing a role to then determine, is this something that is being done with that pure intention that gives life to this action that ultimately is going to get presented or not. Hassan al-Basri, rahimullah, one of the great scholars of our religious tradition, he tells the story of a man who lived at a time where people were not only worshiping other than Allah, but in particular, this man was in a community that had started to give reverence to a tree. And so the man, he takes an ax and he goes now to break down the tree. And as he is on his way to break down the tree, it bliss appears to him, shaitan, the devil, in the form of a human being, asking, what is it that you are going to do? And he said, I'm going to chop down this tree. And the man says, then why is it bothering you? You worship what you worship, let them worship what they worship. And he said, I'm going to chop down the tree. And as they go back and forth, Iblis says to this man that if you don't chop down the tree, when you wake in the morning, you're going to find two dinars under your pillow. And he says, every day that you don't chop down the tree, the next day you will find that same compensation. And the man goes back without chopping down the tree. When he awakes the next morning, the two coins are there. And he goes about his day, and then the next day, again, the two coins are there. And he continues through his day. And on the third day, he goes and looks, and there's no coins there. And he grabs his axe, and he goes in a fit of anger back towards the tree. And again, Iblis comes in front of him and says, what are you going to do? And he says, I'm going to chop down the tree. And he says, no, you will not do it. And the man seeks to set forth, but he is stopped literally in his tracks. And Iblis says to him that when I stopped you the first time, you were going to do something for the sake of Allah. And when you made a decision now to move forward in this way where you accepted these dirhams from me, and when you woke up and you didn't see them there, your action now is not to satisfy what is pleasing to your Creator, your action is now in response to satisfying your own anger. That's why you're not going to be able to get it done. There's a difference in what it is that He intends. The act in and of itself is still manifest in a certain way. To understand what something is, principally we can understand what it is not. And if we want to be able to recognize what sincerity is, we can understand what our tradition teaches us is that it's polar opposite, which is hypocrisy, nifaq. May Allah protect us from it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says amongst many different narrations, one that is more popularly known, ayatul munafiq thalath, that the signs of the hypocrite are three. That when he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he is entrusted, he breaks that trust. The importance of hadith like this are not to weaponize them to now seek to break people down, but in a mode of reflection and contemplation to look back to myself and say, where might this be applicable to me? 
that within the abode of my heart, which is what makes the distinction now between me being able to pray with my body versus pray with my inside, that if you are going to just make dua with your tongue, the distinction is the capacity between dua of the tongue and dua of the heart, whether the presence of the divine is there or not. And if your heart is compelling you in a place to be submissive to a nafs that tells you it's okay to tell lies. There's literally hadith where people come to the Prophet wasallam asking him questions about misdeeds that they engage in. And can these people still be considered to have faith? And he says yes and yes and yes until he comes to a place where he is asked of what about the one that speaks lies? And he says no. There is no iman there. When you look to yourself and you think about what it is that is coming from you that becomes now a block in pursuit of that deed having life that gives back now what it is that you will present to your Lord. Here the Prophet is saying that if you want to know if there's a sign in Ifaq, are you somebody who's truthful or not? Can we have everybody please move up? If you can come in really close. If there's any carpet in front of you. You can fill up the spots. There's a lot more people coming in. إِذَا حَدِثَ كَذَبْ What's getting in the way of the ikhlas? The inventorying at the end of the day that allows for me to assess what it was that came from me, that I did well as well as I did not do well. And you can think just fundamentally within yourself, what is it that comes from you? And how many of those things are things that could be labeled within this characteristic of being mendacious? As he continues, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِذَا وَعْدَ أَخْلَفْ That when he makes a promise, he breaks that promise. You tell somebody you are going to be someplace, then you are supposed to be at that place. You make a commitment to work in a position in a certain way, then you are making a commitment to work in a position in a certain way. When somebody is in a place where you have now said to them that I will X, Y, or Z, the promise is made, the wa'ad is there, you are saying that definitively, yes, you are going to be able to rely on me to get what it is that is done. And it goes across to everybody. My daughter's 10 years old, Medina. My son is seven, Karim. And they'll ask me certain things sometimes. Baba, can you do this? Baba, can we do that? My son wants to go with me to Toronto this weekend. And he told me just a couple of days ago, and he's seven years old. He doesn't understand how certain things work. And I said, Kareem, I'm going to do my best to see if there are flights available and see what it is that they want me to do when I'm there in Canada and see if it makes sense that I can bring you in this short amount of time. And he said, Baba, I really want to go. And I said, Kareem, I'm promising you that I'm going to look into it. I can't tell you what the end result is. It's not all within my hands. And I said, do you know me to be someone who keeps promises that I tell you I'm going to make? And the agitation, the sadness, the anxiety of potentially not being able to go. He said, yes, Baba. I know if you say you're going to look into it, you're going to look into it. Just because he's seven doesn't mean I get to make him a promise and break it. If anything, it's more important to honor the promise because he's learning who it is that he should be when he gets to a place of an elderly age. You make a commitment, you honor the commitment. The place of life that you are in, the relationship you have to the other, if anything, doesn't become an excuse to become absent of ethics, but it is necessary to uphold ethics that much more. The wa'ada akhlaf. 
Can I rely on you? Are you going to do what it is that you told me you would get done? Or the Tu'minu Khan that when they're entrusted, they break that trust. That you made a commitment to me that you were going to honor the rights of this relationship. You chose to have a child and you forgot the sunnah where the Prophet ﷺ tells his child, his grandchildren, that he loves them. The trusts are not always what is done in an official capacity. I can tell my son I make a promise to you, but the unwritten trusts still have to be honored as well. As a father, he is trusting that I am going to honor his rights as a child. When you go into the covenant and you say that you and I are going to be entering into this marriage ceremony that makes permissible now every form of love, emotional, spiritual, mental, physical. I trusted that you were going to do what you said you were going to do. I trusted when I shared with you that you would not gossip about me behind my back. I trusted when I opened up to you that you were going to be able to honor and base the tradition in your decision making that the majalis is a place of amana. The trusts don't always have to be things that are just written down or verbalized. You chose to be a parent, there's a trust between you and the child. Your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is described لَمْ يَدْرِبْ رُسُولَ اللَّهِ إِمْرَأَةً وَلَا غُلَامًا وَلَا وَلَدًا قَدْ That the Messenger of God never struck a woman or a servant or a child ever. You dare to even think of doing that? You're not honoring the trust. If you're in a place where you can somehow think that just because somebody is not watching me on the hour that they're paying me to do what it is that I'm doing, I'm now going to engage in something else. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, when he was Khalifa and he was doing work on behalf of the Ummah, he would use the candle that was provided by the state. And when he started to do his own work, he would extinguish the flame of the candle provided by the state and he would then bring forth his own candle. That is the level of scrutiny that he has to ensure that there is no element of hypocrisy in what I'm doing. The people trust me, I have to honor the trust. Somebody's going to trust you to make dua for them, to pray for them. Then they're trusting you to not engage in base haram at the complacent desires of your nafs. You got to think about it at a bigger level. In terms of the deeds that are going to be presented. And what's keeping the sincerity from being the life force in that action that you are going to present to Allah Zawajal. And so principally for us to understand what something is, we can understand what it is not. Sincerity is not to tell lies. Sincerity is not to break promises. Sincerity is not to break trusts. And as we understand more broadly what these things can be, recognizing it now in terms of affirmation, there is a tabi'i, a man from the generation after the Prophet ﷺ's generation of his Sahaba by the name of Ahmed ibn Miskeen rahimahullah. And he has a student by the name of Abu Nasr al-Sayyad. Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he comes to his teacher one day because he has no job, he has no wealth. And he and his family are hungry. So Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he asks his sheikh for assistance, for help. Ahmed ibn Miskeen, rahimahullah. And the sheikh, he tells his students, go pray two rak'ahs and then come with me to the sea. And they go to the sea and they drop a net into the water and a big fish comes. Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he takes this fish, as the story is told to us, to the marketplace. And he sells it. And in exchange for the fish and what he is able to sell it for, he is now able to purchase two large plates of food. One that is filled with meat and one that is filled with sweets. And he goes to his sheikh, Ahmed ibn Miskeen, and he says, you take one of the plates, ya sheikh. 
And the Shaykh says to him, لَوْ أَطْعَمْنَا أَنفُسْنَا هَذَا مَا خَرَجَتْ سَمَكَ That if I did what I did for some worldly benefit in return, the fish, it would not have come out of the sea. So Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he takes the two plates with him. Because his sheikh is saying, I only did it because it was the right thing to do, not so I would get something in return. And he goes to his home now to be able to give this provision to his family. And on the way, he sees a woman with her infant child, and they are also in a state of need and hunger. And he says, in that moment, it felt like Jannah descended upon me. And he gave these two plates of food to the hungry mother and her child. They express gratitude, they express joy. The tears are coming from the mother's face and the smiles on the child are most apparent. May Allah never make us those who experience real hunger in order to understand what it means to be hungry. And Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he now has to figure out what to do because he gave away the food that was meant for his hungry family. And as he comes to his home and he is there trying to figure it out, a knock comes on the door. And a man presents himself and says that, I took money from your father 20 years ago. And I've been trying to find him. And I was told that he has passed away. So this money, it is now yours. Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he now has wealth more than he could ever imagine. He starts to distribute it to people who are in need and starts to give much charity as he becomes one of the wealthiest men in the city. Can we have everybody just please move up again? If you can come close wherever there's space in front of you so we can make room for people. If you can also move in towards the windows. And he continues to now distribute the charity. His actions of charity start to increase more and more and more. And it became about the quantity of things rather than the quality of things. And he said, I was becoming too confident in my deeds. That he started to do it to show the people that look at what it is that I do. And Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he says then one night he has a dream. And in his dream, he is standing on the day of judgment and the angels are weighing out his deeds, his actions, because this is what we give to Allah. We give Allah our deeds. There's nothing else. You give Allah your amal. That's it. And he says, as the angels are weighing out his deeds, there's all of these acts of charity that are being piled upon the scales. And it is as if nothing is on the scales, he says, like piles of content, because these are acts that have no life to them. They're absent of sincerity. There's no ikhlas in it. He said it was like piles of cotton being put on, looking like it was large in number, but in reality, something that was so futile. And the angels say then, is there anything else that we can bring forward from him? And they then bring the tears of the mother and the smile of the child. And before that, the two plates of food that were given to them. And the two plates, they balance the scale out somewhat. And the tears and the Smile, it adds to it even more. And the tears, it then produces a pool. And from the pool, this giant fish comes and is placed onto the scale. And the angels, they say, that go forth, go forth. Now you are good. And Abu Nasr al-Sayyad, he wakes up from his dream. And he says, لَوْ أَتْعَمْنَا أَنفُسِنَا هَذَا مَا خَرَجَتْ سَمَكَ That if we had done this to have worldly benefit for ourselves, the fish, it would not have come out. 
you got to sit down sometimes and just really think about what it is that you're putting into the world. The hadith tells us that the ones who will ignite the flames of Jahannam, may Allah protect us from it, are the scholar, the one who gave in charity, and the one who was doing jihad in the way of Allah. The ignition of the flames of Jahannam are from these three. That the acts did not have sincerity to them. It's very easy to make a transition where there's no mindfulness in what's being done to begin with. To be able to bring it to a place of recognition. And to think, how is it that I populate what is in my books, not in a way that allows for me to believe something that is not there, but to pay attention to the signs that my body, my heart, my spirit are giving to me. So our teachers tell us that if you're going to come to pray in congregation, which you should, also make sure that you are praying in your houses. Both is an opportunity for the barakah and the home to be increased. But if you are somebody who only prays in front of people and you don't pray when you're on your own, then there's a good chance that you're not praying for the right reason. If it necessitates having an audience where there's a thin line that is still there, nonetheless, the companions, they would say to the Prophet wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, Inni idha ra'aynaka rakat qulubana, that, O oh, Messenger of God, when we see you, our hearts, they become soft. They would say that, Ya Rasulullah, we're not the same as we are when we are with you as when we are away from you. And he said that if you were the way you are when you are with me, when you are away from me, the angels would start shaking your hands. Undoubtedly, the presence of certain individuals in your life, the spaces you frequent, the people who have goodness to them, they're going to play a role in being able to cultivate a sense of awareness and mindfulness. That's not what's being said here. But to be able to think that what is it that motivates me to get up and do what it is that I do? How many times do you have an argument with a loved one and it stops being about what it was that you were arguing about and you just have to be right no matter what? Why? Why do you have to have the last word? Why is it hard to say when you are wrong? You have a messenger who sought forgiveness from his Lord. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 70 times in a day. This is where he went to turn back to Allah with. The sincere heart is willing to be able to acknowledge the mistakes that it makes. An argumentation is not a regular practice. But if you're in a place where you cut people off when they are talking, you're in a place where you always have an opinion and what you say is always what is right and everybody else is always the ones that are wrong. And your heart is telling you something about itself. If you're in a place where you're not even willing to recognize where and how it's so easy in this day and age to believe the hype that one can have of themselves. You can actually believe that what you have is somehow something you're entitled to. And it's a challenge that exists, especially in this country. And it's not something that we can think about other than just objectively. Entitlement is something that runs deep within the systems and structures of this society. I have it because I deserve it. You don't have it because you don't deserve it. Why? You bring Allah into the picture and you start to think about Him in the ways that He is identified. Not even for anyone else's sake. But you don't want to have piles of actions, piles of deeds. And when they're brought onto the scales, it's like they're feathers that weigh nothing. How is it that the Hadith teaches us of the prostitute who because she gave water to a thirsty animal, she has given entrance into Jannah. Where is sincerity with all of God's creation? How is it that we are taught of those who mistreated the rights of animals and they are given to the pits of chastisement? Where is sincerity to all of God's creation? When the power dynamic is more in your favor, 
When you get to a place where you are now able to express, you have capacity to be able to exert influence. You are now the decision maker, not the one that decisions are being made for. The choices you choose, the way that you move, these are things that are going to be presented and the acceptance of them are going to be rooted in this thing of sincerity. Just be real with yourself. You're not fighting because it's the right thing to do. You're fighting because you don't want to admit that you're wrong. Any justification that you can make that gives you validation about breaking a promise, telling a lie, not being someone who's worthy of trust, any excuse that you make is going to have the same end result. All the excuses do is give you a big pile of nothing. Not just in this world, but in the sense of the world beyond this one. When we think about dhikr, the remembrance of the divine. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is defined as being one who remembered Allah all of the time. Kana Rasulullah Allah ala kulli ahyani. I would present to you a different way of being able to understand this through a nuance of language that still evokes what it is. But the idea is not to have dhikr that's just remembrance, but to have dhikr that is a remembrance that is rooted in regard. That in those moments when you are engaged in that practice, the idea is so that when you present the action to the world, when your heart commissions now the body to do, or when the nafs is sovereign and it tells the body to do, the heart comes in and is telling you, hold on, bring some regards to Allah in this situation. What's going to be pleasing to him? Can I really be racist in the name of Allah? Can I truly yell at my child in the name of Allah? Can I sit and speak poorly behind someone's back in the name of Allah? Is that an act that has ikhlas to it, sincerity? And if there's no life in the deed, then you're just presenting corpses to the divine. But you want to strive to have actions that are filled with luminosity. To be in a place that recognizes the entry bar to this religion is not up here, it is down here. It is meant to be for all people to the end of time. Prohibitions are few and obligations are few. There's not so much that one has to do as such. But the embodiment and manifestation of conviction within the act that allows for me to be in a place that I am honest with myself through a prism of consciousness to say, why am I doing it in the ways that I'm doing it in the first place? When I present it to Allah, is it going to have life to it or will it not? May Allah make us from amongst those who all of the deeds that we present to Him are filled with light and life that these are actions that are done that are for His sake and His sake alone with an understanding that doing for the sake of the Divine is what's going to bring you and I the most benefit. You can't go back and change what happened yesterday. But if Allah has blessed you to have another breath to breathe in this world, then understand the capacity of how it is that things move forward and the ability to erase what predates this moment can only come from recognizing what is it that I'm going to do with the days that lie ahead. And so you start to just bring this meaning, break out the signs of hypocrisy, try your best not to lie, don't make a promise you can't keep, and the trust that you have been endowed with. When I sit, man, with people in my office every week, just yesterday, I had three different women reach out two of whom were dealing with their own situation of abuse, a third who is looking for help to bring two asylum seekers from Pakistan who are survivors of sexual assault. These are people who have caretakers that did not honor the trust that were over them. Don't play games with your akhira. And don't play games with people's lives. 
the opportunity to understand that I will not, to the best of my ability, interject lies into this world to the people around me or to myself. I will not make promises that I cannot keep. I'm going to honor every trust that comes my way. And when I get to the end of the day, or if Allah blesses me to see another day, I'm going to make dua. Ya Allah, make me from the mukhlisin. Ya Allah, make me from the mukhlisin. Ya Allah, put life and light into the actions that I put into this world. You got to want it for yourself. And the challenge comes whether we believe it or not. It's still true. So better to use this time to engage in what it is that you've been given the opportunity to engage in. Rather than be in a place when on the scales in front of you, there seems to be so much, but in fact is very little. Not because things were not done, but they weren't done with the best of intentions. In Alhamdulillah, in Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, in Astainuhu, in Astagfiruhu, and Ukminu Bihi, one at Awakulu Ale, when I rule the Billa, him in Shururi and Fusina, women say Ati Amalina, may yet the Allahu Ta'ala, Fala Mudilla, or may you lil Fala Hadiala, when a shadow Allah, Ilaha, Illahu, Wahda, Hula Shari Kala. ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسول. The world is in need of Muslims who actually practice their Islam, who don't understand this religion just as ritual as an ends, but a means to something. When you pray today, pray with your heart, and before you stand to pray, ask Allah to make it a prayer in which your heart is wakeful. Be bold enough to make du'as, to ask of Allah, to keep you from having hope in the things that distract you from His pleasure. Be bold enough on this day of Jummah to ask of Allah to take out of your path the things that create distraction from what is the reality of the Akhirah. Be bold enough to ask of Allah to make you one who does only what is good, to make you the answer to people's prayers. But be in a place where you can recognize your own potential of luminosity so that the deeds that you put into this world, they're just filled with a light that this darkness that sometimes feels so impenetrable, it's just pushed away because that light that comes from you, it is giving us the illumination that we need. On this day of Juma, just think about it. Reflect upon it before that day that all of us will stand in front of our Creator and the deeds will be presented, what is it that's going to really come up in my book? Not just in terms of the quantity of it, but the quality of it. And not based off of what I think is good quality, but what Allah and His Messenger have said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, is what renders good quality. Inshallah Ta'ala, Allah Zawajal will make us from amongst those the scales weigh heavy in our favor on that day and gives us entrance into his Jannah without any judgment. In Allah wa malaikata hu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad fil awalina wa fil akhirin Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallama ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma innaka afuwan kareemun tuhibbul afwa faafu anna ya mukalib al kulub thabbit kulub ربنا على دينك اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين we begin this supplication in your name ya allah and beseech you to send your choicest salutations upon your most beloved sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam we ask that you shower your infinite mercy upon this gathering granting each and every one who is present here in and our loved ones only the best in this world and the best in the next 
We ask, Ya Allah, that if all of us are meant to be together only at this time, at this place, whether we are young or old, male or female, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our social class, our country of origin, our cultural heritage, whether we are Muslim or come from a different walk of life, Ya Rabbi, if our individual hearts are meant to be in the presence of all of their hearts that are gathered here, only at this time, at this place, then gather us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Increase us, Ya Allah, in all that is good. Increase us in courage, compassion, and confidence. Protect us from any affliction, anxiety, or anguish. Remove from our hearts any feelings of bitterness, jealousy, animosity, or envy towards any of your creation. Grant us hearts that are filled with understanding and light. Hearts that are drawn towards things of real goodness and beauty. Hearts that find themselves deep in your remembrance. For indeed in your remembrance do hearts find rest. Make us, Ya Allah, from amongst the mukhlisin of your creation. Make us, Ya Rabbi, whose sincerity is found in abundance in our actions. Let us be a source of light, love, and life for your creation. And let not this blessed day of Juma depart from any one of us without us sitting and reflecting upon what it is that we are going to present to you in terms of the deeds of our world when we stand in front of you on that day. Forgive us, Ya Allah, for any hurt that we have caused to others. Forgive us, Ya Allah, when we have used your religion as an excuse to cause pain to the rest of your creation. Forgive us, Ya Allah, for our negligence of the rights that others have over us. And make us always from amongst those who honor the rights of all of your creation. Protect us, Ya Rabbi, from speaking lies into this world. Help us to be those who always honor the promises that we make. And let us never be from amongst those who break the trust of any, whether it is someone who is younger or older, a neighbor whose name we, for some reason, have still yet to learn, the people that we walk by every single day on the streets, who see us but somehow we still don't see them, the elders who sacrificed for us at a young age, the children that you gave to us as a blessing, but we still justify our mistreatment of, our siblings, our friends, our companions of all kinds. Help us, Ya Allah, to honor the trusts that have been given to us. And let not any one of us meet you with a trust that is broken. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiul alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana, inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khali khalkihi muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وقيم الصلاة